Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dan Trotter, Pretty Good Bible Studies. This video is an introduction to my new YouTube playlist called New Covenant Theology. This video will be concerned with that thorny theological problem of what is the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, or the Old Testament and the New Testament. The thumbnail is looks like this with the gray background. It's called New Covenant Theology. Once I get the playlist constructed, I'll have lots and lots of videos about dispensationalism, about covenant theology, and about New Covenant Theology, which is the uh, theological position uh, I take on this issue. I hope you enjoy this video very much. All right, let's get started with the topic of New Covenant Theology. Now, before I get into the subject, I'm going to do what I call a polemical preview. And the reason for this is that this issue raises a lot of theological hassles, especially from Reformed people. They get very upset about New Covenant the Theology, as I will show you, and they make certain charges against New Covenant Theology. Now, I realized this firsthand when I did a teaching on New Covenant Theology, a series of teachings uh, on New Covenant Theology in a church in the Dominican Republic, and I found myself asking question, answering question after question is, don't you love Moses? Why do you hate Moses so? And then, of course, tithing? You mean tithing's not under the New Testament law of Christ? Are you saying that we need to throw out tithing? And, uh, and uh, if you read the literature by Covenant theologians, they constantly talk about is New Covenant theology, they charge that New Covenant theology is antinomian the favorite smear word of covenant theologians. So I'm going to preclude, I'm going to preempt all that criticism uh, with a polemical preview here, and I'm going to deal with this issue of the anti, so-called alleged antinomianism of New Covenant theology. I'm going to show to you that we are absolutely not antinomian. And then I'm going to deal with the issue of, does the New Testament, New Covenant theology, does that theology trash the Old Testament? I'm going to show, show you no, the Old Testament is a wonderful book. And then I'm going to ask some embarrassing questions for covenant theology for the purpose of taking the burden of proof off of me and putting the burden of proof on them when they say that Moses is the lawgiver for the Christians and his law is the rule of life for the Christians and taking the burden off of me so that I don't have to prove, I don't have to show that Jesus is the lawgiver for the New Testament Christian and that he is our rule of life. It seems to me that the burden of proof ought to be on somebody who wants to disprove that obvious statement. All right, so let's start out. Is the New, is New Covenant theology antinomian? Now, as I said earlier, this is Covenant theology's favorite taunt. They love to use this word. It has a long history. There was a big debate at the 1646 Westminster Assembly, at, uh, which uh, created the famous Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, and there was a big debate over antinomianism then, although the, the term might have been a little bit different. The antinomians then might have been a little bit different than now. And that's one thing you'll discover when you read Reformed literature, exactly what is an antinomian is not so clear. In fact, uh, the famous Puritan theologian, and they're not noted for being antinomians by any means, John Owen, uh, a few years after the assembly, he was called an antinomian by one of his Puritan debaters. And uh, no good Reformed person today would dare call John Owen an antinomian. He is, um, he's beloved amongst covenant theologians, Reformed theologians. And by the way, I need to point out to you that, uh, for those of you who don't know covenant theology, covenant theology comes from the Westminster Assembly. Uh, I'm going to explain what it is in great detail when I get into my playlist and further videos but basically, right now, let's just say it's basically those who hold to a Presbyterian and Reformed position and who quote the Westminster Confession of Faith second only to the Bible. Now, Reformed people today, even today, they debate the Marrow Controversy back in the late 1600s, early 1700s in Scotland. The Scottish Reformed Church was pretty legalistic, and a, um, a guy named E.F., they think is Edward Fisher, wrote a book and called The Marrow of Modern Divinity, and he said that what it takes to get saved is just to have faith and repentance, but unfortunately the Church of Scotland, the Reformed Church there, was saying that 
you need to st stop doing certain sins in order for you to get saved. And if you think about that, pretty soon that means that nobody's going to get saved because everybody sins. And uh, the, the, the marrow men, as they were called, came to say, no, you've got to repent and believe first, and then Jesus will take care of your sins. Uh, you legalistic Scottish Presbyterians, you've gotten sanctification mixed up with justification. You're saying you need to be sanctified in order to be justified, which means that you are believing in salvation by works. So you see, it's been a long, long debate in, in Reformed history. Now, the Reformers will make a distinction sometimes between a doctrinal antinomian and a practical antinomian. A doctrinal antinomian is one who opposes the law of Moses as a rule of life, and that is what New Covenant theology does. So to be strict, they would call us doctrinal antinomian. Anti means anti, nomian means law, but it's not anti-law in general. It means anti-Moses law, anti-Old Covenant law, anti-Mount uh, Sinai, Sinai law. Uh, and if you want to use that terminology, I'm not happy with it, but I'm not offended by it either because that's what I believe. that uh, the, I don't believe that Moses is the law, my law for rule of life. But unfortunately, there's another kind of antinomianism, which is practical antinomianism. And that a practical antinomian is one who opposes all law as a rule of life. In other words, I can just do whatever I want to please. I can have sex with a donkey. I can rob a bank. I can vote for a Democrat. I can do any evil thing. It doesn't matter. There's no law restraining me. Now, unfortunately, the Reformed don't make the distinction enough. So usually they just throw out the word, oh, you NCT people, you New Covenant Theology people, you're antinomian. And so that makes my theology tainted with the smell of immorality. Now, if you think this is just a polemical problem and just a matter of taste and style, I want you to consider... The example of a prominent covenant theologian's libel of in New Covenant theology, and I use that word libel in a very strict, non-hyperbolic sense. Michael Ware, who's a very well-known evangelical theologian, he wrote a book called An Everlasting Covenant, a Biblical Critique, and he was criticizing New Covenant theology, which is fine. But in order to get us ready for the debate, in the foreword of his book, which was written by an anonymous gentleman, uh, the foreword quotes a bunch of heavy hitters against New Covenant theology. For example, Jesus. He, and the, the forward writer says, quotes Jesus saying this, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And the implication is clear. NCT people are practicing lawlessness. Practical antinomianism. Immoral in antinomianism. And then the forward quotes Charles Spurgeon. I do not see how the world could be inhabited with these antinomians. It would become a den of beast. Oh, so that's who we're being associated with, dens of beasts. And then the forward quotes John Calvin, who says this, Passions boiled or wild tumults rise unless these wanton spirits are opposed in time. Of course, wanton spirits were the antinomians of Calvin's day, which were not New Covenant theology people. They were probably true antinomians. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I think they were. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if Calvin does the same thing that Reformed people do today, which is take people who don't believe in Moses as a rule of life, like many of the Anabaptists, and then you start lumping them all in with the people at Munster. I've seen Reformed people do that a lot of times. Oh, the Anabaptists, look what happened in Munster. Well, those people were crazy. But that doesn't mean all Anabaptists were crazy. But anyway, Calvin goes on to say this, Some shake off all obedience towards God and break out into unbridled license. Oh, so that's who this writer of Dr. Ware's book is trying to associate us with. Crazy uh, people, wanton spirits, who are practicing unbridled license. The forward goes on to quote, uh, to say that some, quote, distort the scriptures in order to not be bound by God's law. In order to do what they want, they demonstrate that they are not Christ. Oh, now we're associated with people who aren't even Christians. Let's continue on here uh, with the forward of this book. The author writes this. Some of these antinomian types are servants of corruption. They cast off the law of God, but they are deceiving themselves. Well, you can see what the idea is to smear New Covenant theology. Remember, this is, a, this is, a, this is not a blog post where somebody got temporarily carried away by his emotions and had to go retract it later. This is a published book that went through an editing process. This was a book 
talking about New Covenant theology, and this is what they put in the forward. So you see, polemically, uh, how New Covenant theologians are being treated by their opponents. Now, we get into the book itself, and Michael Ware writes this, New Covenant theology leaves a door open for universalism. I don't know, understand his logic. I don't know how in the world that NCT would lead to universalism. That I hate universalism. I think it's stupid. I think Rob Bell's hell is nonsense. It's, but anyway, I've got this, by the way, I've got the sites of this book in the notes to my PowerPoints, which uh, you don't have access to. But if you don't believe me, uh, I can back it up. He also says that New Covenant theology is asinine, quote, unquote. He says that New Covenant theology is amateurish, quote, unquote. Oh, yeah, Doug Moo is really an amateur. So is D.A. Carson, real amateurs. New Covenant theology leads to heresy and apostasy. Oh, the H word. I tried to find blasphemy. At least, I don't think he said blasphemy. Maybe he did, and I just missed it. Michael Ware goes on to say this. By redefining words, NCT, New Covenant Theology, is, quote, is using, quote, a tactic employed by liberal theologians and politicians. Now, that is the most unkind cut of all. Are you saying that if you are a New Covenant theologian, you are acting like a liberal politician who calls everybody a racist because somebody disagrees with him? That screams and, and hollers in elevators at people that disagree with them and bangs on Supreme Court doors and, and uh, interrupts people who are trying to eat their meals uh, who are opposed to them? That's the kind of tactics we're employing? Well, actually, NCT is just redefining words. Well, that's what liberals do, don't they? Racist is anybody that has a white skin that disagrees with a, a Democrat. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing, too. I don't think so. Uh, Michael Ware also said that New Covenant theology is poppycocking. Now, I don't know what that means, but that is the exact words that he used in his book. So we're poppycocking. The New Co Covenant theology... <laughs> Excuse me, I, didn't, I forgot to click there. We're poppycocking, and New Testament theology must not dupe us. Well, I mean, I would think that an accomplished evangelical theologian like Michael Ware would not be able to be duped by John Riesiger and D.A. Carson and and uh, Thomas Schreiner at Southern Baptist Seminary, and you would think that he would be smarter not to be not to be duped. But I guess he's worried about us dumb clucks out here that aren't theologians, people like me that have been suckered by this horrible heresy, this horrible, asinine, amateurist, leading to universalism heresy called NCT. Now, Michael Ware, as he proceeds, as he gets started in his book at the beginning of the book, after he finishes saying all these terrible things about NCT, he says, this is, this is how he describes his treatment of New Covenant theology, his self-description. This is what he's, how he says he's going to deal with us, with gentleness and love. He's going to use a spirit of humility. Yeah, right. And this is something I've noticed about a lot of theological controversy, a lot of theological polemics. They, they love that word irenic. This is an irenic treatment of the doctrine. We're all brothers in Christ. And then, of course, they get on to start, then they start throwing around the words like blasphemy and heresy. And, but we're all brothers in Christ, and it's ironic. You know, one time I had to write a, a polemical article against a, a brother who was causing a lot of problems, and um, I unloaded on him real good, but I didn't pretend that it was ironic. I just said, I'm coming to nail your hide to the wall. Let's just be honest about it. You know, there's nothing personal about it. It's just business. We had to take care of business here. Uh, but let's, let's, you know, all these gentleness and love. And then you, <laughs> you use all these terrible smear words to describe the position. Uh-uh, that's not going to do. So having had uh, read, I've read Michael Ware's book, and I've decided, and I've seen enough other stuff out there. And I've also noticed New Covenant theologians get kind of ticked about it too. John Reesing has got a, a long letter in one of his books, in the appendix to one of his books that he wrote to R.C. Sproul, who published a bunch of stuff in Table Talk, and it was one person after another calling Reesinger by name an antinomian. I, rem I remember David H.J. Gay, who's a, a British uh, New Covenant theologian guy, writer, who's written a bunch of good books on Kindle, by the way. They're cheap and they're good. They're great. One of them, especially Christ is All in All. And one of his footnotes, 
he, he wrote somebody says, will you please stop calling me an antinomian? I'm not an antinomian. New Covenant theologians, New Covenant theology theologians believe that we're under the law of Christ. Law? What part of law do you not understand, reformers? Law means you're under commands. You're under moral obligations. And in fact, the law of Christ is higher than the law of Moses, as we'll see. That means we got stricter commands. We got to com obey than you. So if there's anybody going to rob a bank and have sex with a dog, it ain't us. Bestiality, that's another. The reformers love to say, well, how do you handle bestiality? How do you handle bestiality? Well, you know, of course, didn't Jesus say that something about sexual immorality? Wouldn't you say that bestiality is a form of sexual immorality? That's in the New Covenant. We can handle that. Anyway, I will not tolerate anyone calling me an antinomian. I will not. I will not go out of my way to be offensive and to attack reformers, as you'll see. I will not say anything bad about reformers going through uh, this um, this uh, playlist. But now, defensively, if I hear somebody doing saying calling me an antinomian, this is I'm going to do three things. First of all, I'm going to call you a pronomian legalist. I mean, I can make up pejorative names too. You know, pronomian doesn't that sound cool? Oh, you want to obey Moses? You're a legalist. Actually, I'm not going to do that, but I mean, I could if somebody called me an antinomian. Uh, of course, I, and I'm going to delete your comments. If you put anything in my comments that I'm an antinomian, bam, off you go. And then I'm going to pray that the fleas of a thousand camels infect your hemorrhoids until eternity. I mean business. I'm not going to put up being called an antinomian. Now, of course, all my defensive actions will be done with gentleness and love and in a spirit of humility. All right, with that unpleasant task out of the way, uh, in defending uh, New Testament, a uh, New Covenant theology against the charge of antinomianism, let's look at the other uh, charge that Reformed often bring against the Old Testament, against uh, New Covenant theology. They say that New Covenant theology trashes the Old Testament. Now, this is not uh, an offensive charge. This is an understandable charge because we constantly say, "No, look, we're not under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Christ." And then so people say, well, then what's the good of the Old Testament? That is a logical question. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a smear. That's not acting stupidly. That's not acting unfairly. That's a perfectly legitimate question, and we need to deal with that. Um, now, as I said, New Covenant theology says Christians are not morally bound by Old Covenant law. Rather, we are morally bound by the law of Christ. Now, that leads to uh, people, as I said, thinking that, well, if we're not bound by the Old Covenant law, why don't we just, are you saying we should just throw out the Old Testament? I've heard people say that to me. So let's look, first of all, as I explain what New Covenant theology really says about the Old Testament, let's do some definite, uh, uh, let, let me first point out that um, by saying we're bound by the law of Christ, that does not mean that we trash the Old Testament. I'll just state that right now. We don't. But before I show you why we don't, we need to make some definitional distinctions. First of all, the Old Testament is not the same thing as the Old Covenant, uh, at least in English. As I, in Greek, as I'll point out later, it might be the same in Greek, but in English we, we have a different idea. When we talk about the Old Testament, we're talking about all of the 39 books of the Old Testament. That includes the prophets and the writings as well as the Torah where the, where the law is. We're talking about we're not under the law. We're not, that has, says nothing about the prophets and the writings. Um, and uh, as opposed to Old Testament, Old Covenant, that contains the part of the Torah it contains that part of the Torah from Sinai to the end of, of Deuteronomy, that part of the law. That's wrong. I should have said it contains that part of the Old Testament from Sinai to the end of Deuteronomy. In other words, the, the law that was given at Mount Sinai. There's a difference between the Moses' law at Mount Sinai and all of the New, uh, Old Testament. Now, here are two things that New Covenant theology does not say. We do not say that the Old Testament has no use for New Testament Christians. It does have use. I'm going to show you in just a minute. It has lots of use. And we're not going to say that the Old Covenant, which is the Mosaic Law, we're not going to even say that that has no use for New Testament Christians, even though we're not under it as a rule of life, as, as something that morally binds us. Well, what does New Covenant theology say about the Old Testament? Well, the Old Testament is a rich source of types which are fulfilled in Christ. Remember uh, the pillar of cloud following uh, the children of Israel. And uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 said that Jesus was the rock which followed Israel. 
Oops, I meant to say that type was in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, not 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, how about uh, Moses bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt and Jesus bringing us out of bondage to sin as the Old Testament people were in bondage to Egypt? Uh, crossing the Jordan over into the promised land. The promised land is a type of the rest that we have in Jesus, a type of heaven, and on and on and on and on and on. There's types everywhere in the Old Testament that we're perfectly free to use and talk about. Uh, I remember when I was accused of throwing out the Old Testament in uh, the M Dominican Republic, I said, well, now, you know, I love the Old Testament. I, I have taken the Old Testament verse by verse from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of uh, Malachi. And I've looked up four, at least four commentaries on each verse and taken extensive notes, and I plan to do a series of Bible teaching on all of the books of the Old Testament because I, I love history for one thing. I love law because I used to be a lawyer, and I majored in history, and the Old Testament's full of law. It's full of history, and I love it. And so I've done all this, and now all of a sudden I find people saying, well, you're trying to throw out the Old Testament. No, I'm not. That is a bogus charge. Don't let, if you're a New Covenant theology believer, don't let any covenant theologian tell you that the old that you don't like the old testament you got all those types how about all the prophecies the virgin birth the jesus being born in bethlehem the shoot that comes out from the stump of jesse and all of that all those prophecies are perfectly good for me I've got no problem with that how about story narratives which provide moral instructions this is where we get our, our sunday school literature and so a lot of people like to poo-poo that because they say, oh, that's all people use the Old Testament for. Well, surely we ought to use it for more than that. But still, those moral stories are great. The story of David and Bathsheba, which tells us, do not commit adultery and murder. Great moral instruction. I, I, kids love that stuff. Daniel and the, and the people in the lions did and shows God's delivering power. I mean, that, that stuff makes big impact on kids' minds and adults, too. There's nothing wrong with story narratives, and, we, and New Covenant theology does not throw that out. Oops, I meant to say the three people in the fiery furnace, not the lion's den. How about wisdom literature, all those Proverbs and all those, all those uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon? Psalms, all that stuff shows us the mind of God, and that's good for us. Not a problem. We're not saying that that's not good for us. Uh, we have great history which shows the progress of redemption, all those covenants with Abraham, with Noah, with David, with Moses. It shows God's plan as he moves throughout history, redemptive historical history like the theologians like to say, or historical redemptive history. And uh, leading up to the new covenant, which progresses all the way into the future when, we'll, when we will uh, see Jesus in the final state. All that, all, the Old Testament's the beginning of all that. That's fine. So, the New Testament in general has a lot of good stuff for us, but even the Old Covenant, the Sinai Law, the moral, ceremonial, and judicial commands, all of them are useful for us, even though we're not under them. They give insight into the moral nature of God, even though the laws are applied to a different people. They're not applied to New Testament Christian. they're applied, Christians. They're applied to Old, Old Testament believers. Uh, the ceremony, even the Reformers say the ceremonial and judicial commands are done away with, but they're still good because all those ceremonial laws are types. Uh, all that stuff about the tabernacle, the 10 by 10 by 10 cubit holy of holies where the Shekinah glory is and the where the candlesticks are showing that Jesus is the light of the world or God's the light of the world and the and then the bread the God is the bread of life for the people as Jesus said he's the bread of life and you know all that stuff is great the old testament is a wonderful book so the answer does new covenant theology trash the old testament the answer is unequivocally no we do we do not trash the old testament now let's look at the third part of my polemical preview some embarrassing questions for covenant theology. Embarrassing question number one. The fourth commandment says you should worship on Saturday. Honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Do you? You say that the Ten Commandments are the rule of life for today. You say the Ten Commandments are written on the hearts of all Gentiles, on Adam and Eve's hearts, uh, and that they pass unchanged into the new covenant that's what you say. Well, one of those Ten Commandments said you should worship on Saturday. Do you worship on Saturday? Second embarrassing question for, for covenant theologians. 
do you really believe the Gentiles were under the Jewish Old Testament law? I had trouble believing that when I read Michael Ware, and he said, yes, the Gentiles under the Jewish uh, Old Testament law. Really? The Gentiles are supposed to worship on Saturday? They're supposed to worship God, the God they don't even know? They're supposed to worship Him on Saturday? Uh, uh, covenant theologians, do you really believe Adam and Eve had the Ten Commandments written on their hearts? Did Adam and Eve worship? Did they worship on Saturday too? Covenant theologians, do you really believe the Mosaic Law, which was designed to arouse sin, will make you holy? Samuel Bolton, the famous Puritan, well, he's not, his, his quote is famous. The law of Moses leads us to Jesus to get us justified, and then Jesus leads us back to the law of Moses to get us sanctified. Do you really believe that? The same law kills us to make us go to Jesus to get saved, and then that same law makes us holy? You really believe that? Actually, they do believe that. To me, that's an embarrassing... I'd be embarrassed to hold such a position. Here's the next embarrassing question to ask covenant theologians. Are such... NCT evangel evangelical luminaries such as D.A. Carson at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Douglas Moo, formerly of Trinity Evangelical Sem Sem Seminary, Divinity School, which is now called Trinity Seminary, I believe. That was my seminary. Uh, Douglas Moo, in fact, Douglas Moo graduated about the same time I did, before he was famous. Uh, he's now at Wheaton College. He's got probably the classic standard work on the book of Romans talking about the law. He's New Covenant Theology, no, doesn't use the name. He has the same beliefs. Is he an antinomian? How about Thomas R. Schreiner at Southern Baptist Seminary? Got the same beliefs. Is he an antinomian? John Riesinger, who's the famous, he's a uh, pastor, he's elderly now. He's still, I don't even know if he's still living, but he's written a bunch of books on New Covenant Theology. Uh, there is no way. I've listened to John Riesinger's tape after tape and read a lot of his book, Riesinger's books, and I guarantee you he's no antinomian. You want to call him an antinomian? Stephen J. Wellam, Southern Baptist Sem Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He's a professor there. Is he an antinomian? Is he a heretic? Is he amateurish? Is he asinine? Do you really want to say that? Another embarrassing question for covenant theologians. When you use your flashlight at night and turn it off during the day, do you hate your flashlight because the sun is brighter than your flashlight? And that's what we say about Moses. Moses was good, but something greater than Moses is here. That doesn't mean that Moses was bad for his time. He was the best they had. He was good, but something greater than Moses is here, just like Jesus was greater than John the Baptist. We don't hate John the Baptist. We don't trash him. We don't trash Moses. Next embarrassing question for covenant theology. Since covenant theology states that Jesus has replaced Aaron as high priest, does that mean that covenant theology trashes Aaron? Is that what you do, reform? Do you trash Aaron because he's gone now and Jesus replaced him? And since New Covenant theology says Jesus also replaced Moses as lawgiver, does that mean that New Covenant tra theology trashes Moses? I don't think so. But anyway, I'll leave those for your contemplation. Now that we've got the polemical preview out of the way, let me just give you a brief overview of New Covenant theology. First of all, we're going to talk about what is the fundamental problem that New Covenant theology seeks to solve. And then I'm going to look at three different positions that have tried to solve that same problem, which is what is the relationship of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? And the, and, uh, the issue is sometimes called this is termed this way, the problem of continuity versus discontinuity. Are the two covenants continuous? Do they move from the old to the new in a flat uh, manner in which there's no change? It's flat. Or do we have dis discontinuity where there's a break between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Then we're going to briefly talk about a definition of covenant. So let's talk about first the fundamental problem. What is the relationship between the Old and the New Covenant? That's the problem. Now, the answer to this problem affects many important issues, practical issues, which we are not going to cover even in this playlist, unless I live long enough to do it. But uh, I'm not planning to right now. But you'll get into issues such as infant baptism, Sunday Sabbath worship, the relationship between the church and civil governments, church and state, tithing. You can see that. It, th that's a boatload of controversy right there. If the fundamental problem 
had been solved properly by the reform, the relationship between the Old and New Covenants, or by the dispensationalists for that matter, if that relationship had been solved properly, there wouldn't be any problem with infant baptism. There wouldn't be any infant baptism. There wouldn't be any Sunday Sabbath worship. There would not be any uh, church-state conjunction. And there wouldn't be a law of tithing. Because we're free from all that. We're in the New Covenant now. We're not in the Old Covenant. Now, let's look at three different positions that can be taken on this, uh, and they are distinguished by the degree of continuity or discontinuity present in each position. First of all, we have covenant theology. That's the Reformed, the Presbyterians, the Westminster Confession of Faith. And then we have the Dispensationalists, Dallas Theological Seminary, Charles Ryrie, Schaefer, and so forth. Um... And then we have, that's dispensationalism, then we have the mediating position, New Covenant Theology, which is the position that uh, this tape series, this, this video series is holding. Now, covenant theology has complete continuity between the Old and New, co- the old and new Covenants. Uh, in other words, when, Jesus, when Moses' law was given, it, it goes completely into the New Covenant, except for the ceremonial and judicial aspects of that law, by the way. Let's put it this way. The moral part of the Old Testament, the, excuse me, the moral part of the Old Covenant of the Mosaic Law passes straight through into the New Covenant. Now, dispensationalists say there's no continuity at all because dispensationalists say that everything in the Old Covenant, the prophecies and the laws, too, for that matter, were pointing not to the church age, but past the church age into the future millennium. So they're, they're all pre milled and they believe in this future millennium and that all this Old Testament stuff has nothing to do with the church. New Covenant theology has what we could call partial continuity. Uh, the purpose of God doesn't change. The purpose of God was to create a church, just like the covenant people say. Yes, the purpose of God doesn't change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. However, the covenants that the people of God are operating under do change. And so in the Old Testament, we got believers under the, under the Mosaic Covenant. And in the, uh, and in the New Covenant, we have believers under the new lawgiver, Jesus, and we call that the church. And the New Covenant people don't believe there's a church in the Old Covenant. They believe that people believed in God in the Old Covenant, but it was a different situation. There are different kinds of believers. So it's partial continuity. They believe that the Old Testament does point to the church, so there's continuity in the types and the prophecies and, uh, uh, pointing to the, um, to, the, to the New Covenant church, but they don't believe that the moral laws under the um, law of Moses passes on into the New Covenant theology, uh, into, the New, into the New Testament. So those basically is an overview of the three positions. Now, Let's look more deeply at the at covenant theology, which position is a position that advocates complete continuity between the covenants. Covenant theology says that both the old covenant and the new covenant are within one covenant. This covenant is called the covenant of grace. Now, this is rock solid. You got if you're going to be a Presbyterian Westminster Confession of Faith, you will believe this and you will defend this to your dying breath. You're not going to let go of it. And basically, uh, this one covenant of grace covers Moses and Jesus, and so therefore the law given at Mount Sinai is a gracious covenant. It's God's grace, um, and I know that's hard to believe, but that's what they believe, despite the fact that, what is it, in Galatians 3, it says, do this and live. Somewhere in the New Testament talks about keeping the law, you got to do this and live, and if you keep one part of the law, you'll, you'll live. Keeping the law uh, but it's still a matter of grace because we can't keep it, and Jesus forgives us for not keeping it, and therefore it's grace, according to the covenant theologians. And that is very similar to the new covenant, which is also a covenant of grace. Well, then, you say, well, what's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant? It's the same covenant, but it's a different administration. It's carried out a little bit differently. So now we're starting to get into some fine distinctions here. At any rate, this idea that the covenant people have that the Old Covenant and the New Covenant are part of the same covenant of grace means that in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, we have circumcision. In the Old Testament, too, for that matter, we have circumcision. We get into the New Testament, that becomes infant baptism because it's just a different administration of the same covenant of grace. Circumcision is a sign of the covenant people in the Old Testament. Infant baptism is a sign of the covenant people in the New Testament. 
we have Saturday Sabbath in the Old Covenant becoming Sunday Sabbath because it's all part of the same covenant of grace, just a slight change of administration. We switch the days, and we keep right on going. And Old Testament tithing becomes New Testament tithing. That's the covenant position. This is a position which I thoroughly and with vehemence reject. I don't believe that circumcision becomes infant baptism, and I'm certainly not going to start worshiping on Saturday, Sunday as a Sabbath day, and I'm not going to get under an Old Testament tithing law. Oh, but that means you don't believe in you. Oh, no, no, no. The new, under the New Testament, it was cheerful giving, lots of giving in the New Testament. Anyway, we'll get into that later. The uh, dispensation position, which says that there's no continuity, says that prophecy in the Old Testament is not fulfilled in the New Testament. Rather, it's fulfilled in the so-called millennium in the future. So therefore, the church is kind of like a nothing burger, or a vacuum, a parenthesis, and we don't care about what the law said. Well, New Covenant theology says, no, the, lo the law is fulfilled prophetically in Jesus, or typologically at least in Jesus. All right, now, New Covenant Theology, which is an uh, intermediate position, and by the way, uh, John Riesiger makes this point. It's not, it's not that New Covenant theologians deliberately tried to pick a position that was between the two competing alternatives of covenant theology and dispensationalism. It's just that it happened to turn out that way. They were looking for the truth, and it ended up in the middle. All right, how is New Covenant Theology different from Reformed uh, Covenant theology, which says there's complete continuity between the covenants. New Covenant theology says the New Testament Christian is not under the Old Testament Mosaic law. The Christian is not under the Old Testament ceremonial law. The New Testament Christian is not under the Old Testament civil law. The New Testament Christian is not under the Old Testament moral laws. Rather, we're under the Old Testament law of Christ, which supersedes and enhances the Old Testament moral laws. Oops, I meant to say that the New Testament Christian is not under the Old Testament moral law, but is rather under the New Testament law of Christ. The New Testament law of Christ, not the Old Testament law of Christ, of course. Now, the Reform will agree on this. They say we're free from the ceremonial law and free from the civil law, but we're not free from the Old Testament moral laws. Jesus just explains those moral laws. He, didn't, he doesn't give us new ones. Um... The problem with the Reformed position is how do you distinguish these laws, ceremonial, civil, and moral? And that Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, is, a, is that a moral law that we're supposed to worship on Saturday, or is that a ceremonial law? Now, how, does, how is New Covenant theology different from dispensationalism? New Covenant theology says that Old Testament prof prophecy is fulfilled in the New Testament church age, not in the millennium. So, therefore, the law has more meaning for us than it does for dispensationalism. And not only the law, but also the prophets, too, as well as the law. Okay, so that's a basic overview of the three different positions. We'll be looking at that in great detail as we go through the videos uh, in this playlist. I'm going to explain what dispensationalism is, dispensationalism is. I'm going to explain what covenant theology is in great detail. And then I'm going to finish up by explaining what new covenant theology is in great detail. Before we do that, before we get started... Let's talk about the third part of this overview, this introduction. What is the definition of covenant? There's a little problem with the definition that can be a little confusing. Um, covenant and testament are close in English, but they're different. They're the same in Greek, by the way. The Greek word is one Greek word that translates them, but we'll just deal with the English right now. First of all, a covenant is an agreement between two living parties. It's like a contract plus ceremony. Uh, if I offer to sell you a car and you offer to pay me $2,000, that's a contract. If we sit down and have a meal together and we sacrifice uh, animals and make a, a, a row of uh, two files of uh, dead, bleeding animal parts, and then we both walk between the two uh, rows of bleeding animal parts, thus signifying that we will be cut to pieces if we, do, if we don't either deliver the car or deliver the cash. And then we take a self-maledictory oath. We say, I swear by heaven that I'll be split in half if I don't pay you. Well, then that's a covenant. 
So it's a contract plus ceremony and rituals between two living parties. A testament is a will. Property is passed by one deceased party to another. So there's a difference here. A covenant takes two people and a testament takes one people. Now, where's the problem? Well, you see, the, distance, the difference between a divine covenant and testament is not too great, at least Abraham's covenant. Because God's covenant with Abraham was unilateral, not bilateral. You recall Abraham was sleeping, and God himself, in the form of the smoking fire pot and the smoking torch, went between those two rows of animals, which means that God says, I'm going to keep the covenant. Now, theologians will debate this till the cows come home. Is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? How about Davidic covenant? Unilateral or bilateral? No, I don't care. Uh my feeling is that Abraham's covenant was unilateral. I think most people think that way because Abraham was the only one that passed between those animals. Well, I'm making a mistake a minute here. It was not Abraham that passed through those animals by himself. It was God who passed between those two rows of bloody animals by himself. God did it by himself, not Abraham. Okay, so... His divine, even though usually a covenant has two parties, in the case of Abraham's covenant, it was only one party, uh, which makes it just like a, a, a testament, which is a one-party legal deal. Now, as I said earlier, the same Greek word is translated by covenant and testament, and it's real fun. I was doing a, a Bible, I was studying Hebrews, and I uh, looked at the uh, theological debate over whether diatheke, I think is the Greek word, whether it should be translated as covenant or testament. It's really interesting. Uh, the reason they have the, the translators, the English translators have trouble with that is because both covenants and testaments require the shedding of blood. If it's a testament and somebody dies, well, maybe he doesn't shed blood, but that's symbolic for he has to die. When you shed blood, you die. So the testament requires the shedding of blood, and a covenant requires shedding of blood to kill all those animals. So they're close like that. Um, now, in both a covenant or a testament, the recipients of the blessings could not alter the stipulations, whether it's a will, a testament, or whether it's a covenant. It doesn't make any difference. You can't alter the stipulations. So you see they're very close. Now, so for the purposes of this playlist, we're going to use the word covenant because we're talking about, as it, when we say new covenant theology, because in our loose English, not in the Greek, but in English, Old Testament means the whole book. Now, I've already made a distinction between testament and covenant already, and it's important because... We don't believe in throwing out the Old Testament. The Testament refers to the law, the prophets, the writings, all of it. But the covenant only refer the Old Covenant, as in the book of Hebrews, refers to the law given at Mount Sinai to Moses. So it's it's um, the covenant. So in English, the way people are using the terms now, covenant refers to the law at Mount Sinai. Testament refers to the whole book. We need to keep that distinction in mind. In loose English, Old Testament means the whole book. All right, so the connection of the Old Covenant and the New Co Covenant, let me just summarize it with a broad over overview statement here. Why is this so important, the relationship between those two covenants? Because one can never understand the Bible and God's plan of redemption without understanding the covenants and their relationship. You can't understand anything. This theological issue is so fundamental. I've already mentioned the practical implications, the baptism, infant baptism, the tithing, the Sunday Sabbath, uh, church-state relationships. All throughout history, how much blood has been spilt and how many word, angry words have been spoken over those issues is because Christians have not been able to understand the relationship between these two covenants. And this has gone on ever since the beginning of the church, the very beginning of church history. So that's the task before us. Thank you very much for listening to this overview. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you continue to listen to the other videos in this playlist.